because people are so failure averse that they rather stay in a place of mediocrity than to take things to the next level and take the chance. And, and that's something that I always think for myself. And I'm like, imagine if I was afraid of failure back to when I was 20 and I didn't move, where would I be right now? And I think that whenever we're talking about fitness and about, you know, investing in, in yourself and in your health, be that an investment financial in your time, whatever that looks like for each individual, everything is a 50-50 in life. 150 is for you to stay the same. And if you're not happy with where you are, that's the 50 that you're going to choose to stay. Mm -hmm. Or you can take the 50% chance of creating change and live a, live a life that is probably going to be much better than the one you have now. Mm. So one of the things is is the personal responsibility, meaning don't put the onus on anyone else. Yeah. Don't say you can't have time because of your children or you can't have time because of your work. <laughs> Welcome to the Dr. Gabrielle Lyon Show. In this episode, I bring to you a very special guest. She is the first athlete of her kind on the show, and her name is Natalia Mello, former Miss Bikini Olympian. What did we talk about in this episode? We talked about how destructive cyclical fad dieting is. We also talk about why you are not losing weight. And finally, how to find the perfect plan. Those are just a few highlights. This episode, we dive deep into what it takes to go after your goals. It's not what you think. It's not always the physical. It starts with the mental. I know that you're going to love this episode. And if you love it as much as I do, please remember that this is free content. And the only price for it is that you push this message forward. This is a message of strength. And together, we can be forever strong. Thank you to Element for sponsoring this episode of the show. Here's the thing. Sodium is very important to the body. We need it. It is important for many cellular functions. When we are sweating and doing activities, we typically deplete electrolytes. And these electrolytes include sodium, potassium, magnesium. One reason why I love Element is because it has all of these things in a evidence-based ratio. Therefore, if you are someone who is exercising, someone who gets headaches or muscle cramps or weakness or is just overall dehydrated, Element is an incredible addition to your plan. It is formulated to help anybody with their electrolyte needs. And it's suitable for any nutrition plan, whether you are keto, carnivore, or dare I say it, on the Lion Protocol, Element can help you. Head on over to drinklmnt.com slash Dr. Lion, and you'll get eight single serving packets free with any element order. This is a go-to supplement for us. I will never recommend or be sponsored by any product that I don't actually use myself. Element is a long time staple. Head on over to drinklmnt dot com and use the code Dr. Lion and you will get eight single serving packets free with any order. Natalia Mello, I'm so excited to have you on the show and you happen to have been one of the best bodies in the world. And by the way, you and I trained this morning. Uh, it's, uh, I think that you still are one of the best bodies in the world. You are a former Miss Olympia bikini. Yes. Yeah. In the workout today, I might have died a little bit, but, I, I, but I'm here. I, I, I didn't fully die. <laughs> you, you survived. And the reason I wanted to bring you on the show, um, number one, I just love your attitude and your fortitude. The other reason is what it takes to be the best body in the world and what that means in terms of how you maintain it, the transition, what is real life mm -hmm. versus stage like. And the the aspect of everything is number one, you have two children. Yeah. And you run a business and you have been at the top and yeah. you have still maintained an excellent level of fitness and really seen it all. So tell me a little bit about your history of how you even got to the Olympia stage. Oh, that's such a great question. First, thank you for having me here. I'm super excited. Um, when you ask me, I'm like, ah, 
Anyway, so um, I moved from Brazil. I'm originally from Brazil, moved from Brazil to the US. Um, and I had been working out since I was like 14. I would save my allowance back in Brazil because my mom thought that gym was a waste of money. So I was 14, I would save my allowance for like two months to be able to pay for one month of gym membership because I'm an old folk. At the time, there was no like direct debit. So I had to come in and literally like give the cash. So I could only go to the gym every other month. Um, so fitness has always been a big part of my life. Um, but then I went to law school. I don't know if you knew that. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wait, uh, but why was fitness a big part of your life? Um, I just feel like um, now in hindsight at my 39 years of age. Um, I think whenever I look at it, it was almost like a form of control. Um, you know, Latino families, Latino moms, especially, they can be very uh, controlling and overbearing. And I think that fitness was my way of finding my my own control of self. Um, and I just liked the physique, um, you know, having more muscle muscle and things like that. So I just started going to the gym on my own when I was 14. Um, Fast forward, got in law school. Law school? Yeah, law I school in Brazil no is, a, is a bachelor's degree. Okay. So I got in law school when I was 17. Um, then, ha because in Brazil, you have two options. <laughs> For Latino families, they either allow you to be a doctor or, or a lawyer. I'm like, yeah, I don't do well with body <laughs> fluids, so I think I'm going to be a lawyer. Fair. So I dropped out of law school um, halfway through, and then I moved to the U.S. Why? Why did you, you leave? So I started doing an internship in the courthouse. And I don't know how much you know about Brazil. Not much. Justice is not really the first word that comes to mind whenever we're talking about a country like Brazil. Um, so I started working in the courthouse and I started to start a lot of things that I didn't find that aligned with my belief and the reason why um, I, I went into to law. Um, and all jokes aside, I really was very interested in law, um, you know, so whenever I started working in the courthouse, I saw a lot of things that I found that didn't align. And I knew that I was going to have to become part of that system that I didn't want to. Um, so I, I wanted to go somewhere else with most opportunities. And there you kind of have to know someone or come from a family that is known. Anyway, so I just decided that I wanted to go somewhere else. And that's kind of when I came to the U.S. I came to the U.S. with like $350 to my name. Incredible. Sold my car, um, cleaned restaurants uh, from midnight to seven in the morning for $35, lived in the hood. I mean, like there were cockroaches climbing on my bed and things like that. Um, and it's a lot of fortitude. You were so determined. I was 20. I was 20. Um, and, and I, but I just kept on pushing because I knew. Um, and, and, you know, in hindsight, I'm like, Shada, like, how did I know? But I just feel, you know, when you feel that if, you, if I keep on swimming, I'm going to get to a place where I'm going to look back and it's just going to be a season of life and I'm going to be telling that story. And here we are, you know, almost 20 years later. So um, then slowly I started to get my life in, in, in order. But fitness kept on being a part of it on and off, but always a part of it. And I started bartending um, in, in a very known bar. I lived in South Florida at the time and I used to have a personal trainer and in the gym, they were like, Hey, why like, don't you compete? And my idea of competing was the big body build body, nothing against it, but just, it wasn't a look that I wanted to have. And, um, and then they're like, no, there is this new division called bikini. And I'm like, mm, tell me more. <laughs> and even bikini for me at the time was a lot. But for me, to compete was not about the body. The body was going to be a byproduct. It was about having a purpose. Because at the time, I was bartending and getting white girl weight every night. <laughs> uh, not the ideal pathway to health. No, yeah. no, no, no. And that's kind of where I was like, yeah, I really don't think that I... I'm going to get to where I want to be if I keep on living this life. So I decided to start competing more as a, a purpose to wake up every single day. Thank you to Timeline for sponsoring this episode of the show. Timeline Nutrition, Nutrition makes something called MitoPure. And MitoPure is clinically proven to deliver six times more urolithin A than a glass of pomegranate juice. Urolithin A is incredible. It is something called a postbiotic. It is the first and only clinically tested, highly pure form of the potent pomegranate 
postbiotic, and you're thinking, what the heck is she talking about? And a postbiotic is made from the gut microbiome. And 60% of people do not have the right gut microbiome to make urolithin A. And why urolithin A matters is that it has been shown to help help with mitophagy, which is the regeneration and the removal of old mitochondria. So essentially, it gives you more energy. It has been shown in humans to improve strength and endurance. It's been proven to help with the health of mitochondria. It's really incredible. There is a ton of data and a ton of research behind urolithin A, and MitoPure is my go-to. Head on over to TimelineNutrition.com slash Dr. Lion. That's right. TimelineNutrition.com slash Dr. Lion. And that's kind of how I, I started competing. That was in 2008, 2009. And I won my first like five competitions. And I was in the first ever Olympia, which was in 2010. It's amazing. And your purpose, when you think about the purpose, was the purpose mental? Was it physical? What? How, how did you think about it? I just, I just felt like I, um, so I start to look my, at my surroundings in a bar, you know, you see, I think the, the worst of everybody, um, you know, it was a great bar, but you were always seeing, you know, I would see a guy with a woman in one night and then I would go to church mm -hmm. on Sunday and he would be with his wife. And I'm like, that's not the lady that I saw you last night in the bar with. So you start to see a lot of things that I didn't want to become normalized for my And, um, you know, I looked at it as a job, but we all know we become a product of our environment. Yes, ma'am. So whenever I start to look at the environment in which I was in, I knew that I had to counterbalance that with something that was bigger than myself in order for me to not normalize that because I knew that it was wrong. Mm. So that's kind of the lack of purpose. I just felt adrift at the time, like in a boat, you know, in the middle of the ocean. And you're like, oh, shit, like, what do I do next? And that's kind of how competing came. It wasn't for the body. It wasn't for the clout. It wasn't for the trophy. It was really just to get my shit together and ha work towards something. But what you worked towards was something extraordinary. I mean, that yeah. is for people that don't know what uh, Miss Olympia is, bikini. And again, it's it's changed from the time that you did it. Yeah. But the amount of discipline, I mean, you are stepping on stage in your bikini. Yeah, yeah. For people to judge, judge you. you, you are putting yourself in a position to be physically judged. Yeah. The preparation and training, talk to us about that because, you know, my audience, again, you guys, one of the reasons why I wanted Natalia on here is because of the practical experience of being yeah. the best at what you did and really thinking about what it took. We're not talking about a sport performance. We are talking about bringing your body composition to a certain level of how the expectation was and how did you train for that? What were some of the things that you did? How, just walk us through it. So um, I find that bodybuilding as a whole, it's, it's much more mental than physical. Um, I, I cannot even begin to tell you how many times I cried on top of a treadmill and, you know, <laughs> eating my dried ass chicken in the car. And I, I, true story, somebody, I was eating my chicken in the car. It was so dry. I started choking and I started crying. I'm like, why am I doing this to myself? <laughs> Later that day, somebody sends me a message on Facebook asking if I was okay because they saw me crying in the car. With your dried chicken. With my dried chicken. But um, it, it was arduous. And at the time I worked three jobs as well because, you know, a lot of the ladies that were doing it, they had parents to support them or they had a partner to support it. I had myself to support myself. So I had to still, I was still bartending four or five days a week. I was personal training. I was working for a supplement company at the time. So in addition to the preparation, which was incredibly arduous, um, and at that stage, at that level in at how new bikini was at the time, it was not very financially viable for you to make a living just from that. So, um, and, and in hindsight now with, you know, many years and I, uh, listen, we don't know, but um, I find that a lot of the things that I did were incredibly unhealthy. And that's why I'm such a big advocate of, balance and, um, you know, finding a level of sustainability for life, because 
a lot of people try to replicate that. So we're talking about four hours of cardio a day, three, four hours of cardio a day. How many days a week? Six, seven, ten. Like. <laughs> so every day a week to set us up for a Olympia prep, you're talking about four to five hours of cardio a day. Yeah, I was doing anywhere like varying between three. So it started with two and then my weight wasn't dropping and then it would be three. And then I was running like, what, 12 miles a day because the coaches that I had at the time, very bro kind of approach. Um, but again, the broskies, the broskies. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it was like, oh, you know, just run because anything else is not going to be good. The muscles or whatever. So off I went and ran 12 miles a day. That's a lot of discipline. Yes. I cried on top of a treadmill, too. Um, <laughs> I, I, think, of I think I, I would also cry on top of the treadmill. <gasps> Four, so four to five hours a day. And that's just the cardio. Just the cardio. What and, else? And then there was the weightlifting. Um, very bro-like as well. Um, you know, the waist trainer, like so I, I was told to wear two waist trainers, not just one, but two. I could feel like my hands going numb and white because of the circulation. But you still pushed through. Didn't matter. You still did No, it. no, because, um, and again, I, I did question some of those things, um, but it was just kind of like, oh, that's what you do. Um, and I just, I just kept on pushing because the only thing that came to mind is like, I can feel it, I can touch it, I can see it. If I give up now, if I'm on my deathbed, what conversation am I going to have with my younger self for giving up? Yeah. And, and that's kind of how I kept on, on pushing forward. What kind of nutrition? What was the nutrition like? Oh, it was awful. Um, there was a lot of orange roughy. A lot of orange roughy. What, what, I mean, the listener is thinking, okay, so what does it take to have the best body in the world? A lot of... Um, mental strength. I think more because than you're hungry, right? You're very hungry. You're hungry, especially for women. Um, you know, for the men is the opposite. They have to eat a lot. For the women, you don't eat very much. And, you know, and because the bikini division has always been very kind of like soft, not too soft, symmetrical, not too symmetrical, vascular, not too vascular. And it, it's so incredibly um, subjective in a way that you don't even know what the the terms are, everything's just so vague. So you're just pushing yourself to the max. Of whatever is being asked of you. When you don't even know what the being asked is. Mm, so it's a moving target. Yes, it's, the goalpost is constantly, constantly moving. Um, so that was, I think, the, the biggest challenge, not really knowing what the ultimate physical goal was. Um, that's, a, that's major. Yeah. The, so the nutrition aspect, do you remember how many grams of protein, how it was all put together? So that, that's the interesting thing, um, that there wasn't a lot of education around what we were doing. You were just like, do this, speed up your metabolism and all like the buzzwords. So there was a lot of orange roughy. There was a lot of chicken. Um, there was a lot of asparagus, um, sweet potatoes, rice cakes, prunes. I'll binge on freaking prunes. How sad is that? And he was like, you can have six almonds. Like, it's very strict. I, yes. And I, I remember so vivid, so this one plan, you're going to laugh at this. There were six penny noodles, six. So my dumb ass is like there <laughs> <laughs> counting six penny noodles, putting in a Ziploc bag and like dropping in like, oh, and then three cherry tomatoes. Got it. And then you put the three cherry tomatoes. So everything is very measured. Everything. 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 Now, is that sustainable? No. And what is the outcome? Because you're being so physically judged, how does that change the relationship with your body, how you view it, what is normal? versus what is abnormal? How does that just affect your psyche? Oh my goodness, uh, how much time have we got? <laughs> um, no, it, it, it really is such a great impact, uh, not in a good way, because here's one thing that you have to remember, you're so restricted for such a long time, okay? And I find that in competition that is just amplified, but this is 
variants of people who do fat diets now That's, also experience. I'm so glad that you so, brought that up. That's so if we're exactly. talking in in a more kind of like, oh, but I'm never going to compete on stage. It's the stage is just a little bit of a more amplified version of what everybody who is doing the fat diets now experience because you have a beginning and an end. So you're like balls to the walls for that period. And then after that, you're so deprived for that period that you, you, f you forget. You're just like, I'm just going to eat. I ha Gabrielle, I haven't told this to like in many podcasts, but I actually had a sick bucket by my bed after winning the Olympia or after competing in shows. And again, can it be maybe because of the type of coaching that I had? Maybe, I don't know. But I think that it is important to highlight this side of what many people perceived as healthy. Mm. And whenever I start to analyze and look at those things, I'm like, this is not normal. Mm. I, I don't care how you want to frame it. And I think that a big come to Jesus moment for me was my husband was a, for, for a professional rugby player, very accomplished, high level. He played for Ireland. He played for what would be called the... Uh, all stars, like it's called the barbarians. So Roger was very respected in, in rugby. And whenever I started dating him, I started to look at his life as a elite athlete as well. And I'm like, hold on a second. This doesn't feel right. What I was doing didn't feel right because I like, I saw him being able to live life and, you know, there was an on and off switch. But with what I did, there was no on, on and off switch, if, even if I didn't have a competition. So I, I was gaining like 15, 20 pounds, anywhere between 10 and 20 after competition. And, you know, I had the skinny um, wardrobe and then I had the fat wardrobe. And they were like fluctuating four or five sizes. And, but then whenever I was competing or getting ready, I was miserable. So I didn't want to do anything. But then whenever I was not competing, I was fat and sassy and I didn't want to do anything because I was too embarrassed because in my mind, I had to meet this standard of health and fitness that people had set for me. And I'm like, if I show up looking like the way I, I am now, now, what, what are people going to think? And now even saying this is like, who gives a shit? But People are looking you, at you in cover of magazines and they're seeing you everywhere and you are you don't look like the girl in the magazine. And it's happened to me. Mm. So it creates this like crazy relationship with self. Yeah. And think about how many people that are people struggling with different diets, weight loss diets, fad diets that they don't even have to compete but still have that experience. A hundred percent. Where... They have, you know, when I was in residency, when I was in, yeah, my second residency, I gained, I must have gained 10 pounds. I was so mm. stressed. I wasn't sleeping. I had to buy, and I'm 5'1", as you know. Yeah. Um, I'm a very tiny human. I had to purchase new clothes and that was my new wardrobe. And then again, I had a smaller wardrobe and it, it kind of oscillated for at least a year. Yeah. And I will tell you that I know that you're not alone, I'm not alone, that tons of people, whether they are male or female listening, have gone through that. How did you begin to reconcile the kind of in-between? What was the, what did you do? So I, I, I tried to compete a couple more times after winning the Olympia. I tried to compete a couple more times with an attempt of being quote unquote normal, whatever normal is but at that point I didn't even know what normal looked like because you start to become so you become a, a product of your environment once again and then whenever you look everybody around you f counting freaking six penny noodles you're like oh that's completely normal but then I would come home and my husband would be a normal person although he was a elite a athlete so I competed a couple more times and I'm like if I want to develop a better relationship with food. And most importantly, we knew that we wanted to have kids. And being from a Latino background, there is a big emphasis in appearance and diets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was doing the cabbage soup diet with my mom since I was freaking 10. That's young. Yes. And, and you're very exposed to body dysmorphia and body appearance and all of that. I knew that I didn't want to repeat that with my children. 
So how did you, did you end up getting or having on the spectrum some kind of body dysmorphia? Oh, a hundred and quadzillion. Per- I remember taking a diuretic to go to a pool party because I didn't think that I was enough that I looked good in a bikini at 128 pounds. How did you solve for that? How did you untangle that? How did you solve for that? I think that the first, the first thing is really to acknowledge that there is a problem. And for me, the, the solution was to step away from competing because you, you would automatically be a trigger to kind of keep on reverting to what I knew that worked which I find that's what a lot of people do with different diets. They keep on reverting. Oh, you work. Well, you work until it doesn't. And what is your definition of work? Because if you keep on gaining the weight back and feeling like a bag of shit, does it work? Yeah. So you was acknowledging that. And, you know, a lot of therapy to, to be able to come to terms with that and staying consistent, not trying to keep on going back to the, the, to the extremes, just, oh, but it's just for that one vacation that I have to go. Because every time that you go back, you're almost starting back from square one. And you coach clients now, right? Yes. And what, when they struggle with, I'm sure they all struggle with that. They have struggled with extremes. They have struggled with body dysmorphia, self probably worth in terms of how to move the needle. Uh, How do you speak to them in a way that moves away from diet to more lifestyle? So that's a great question uh, because that, that's another thing that I saw a lot in the bodybuilding space. Everybody tries to do everything. Everybody's a jack of all trades, but they end up being a master of none. I've always been very aware that I have my lane. I can speak from my experiences, but I'm not a mental health professional. And whenever we're talking about body dysmorphia and mm. disordered eating and things like that, it is slightly above my pay grade meaning my field of expertise. I can share my experience and talk about how I feel, but I'm not an expert. And just because you work for me, surely there are different ways that might work for other different people. So I have a counselor on my team as well to help navigate those, uh, the mindset piece of it. And also the same thing with the nutrition piece. Do I know how to diet? Do I understand about food? Do I? Absolutely. But I didn't, you know, that's not my, my lane. Right. So we have a registered dietitian as well, who has a lot of experience with um, extreme dieting because she was a national champion cheerleader and a flyer. So the whole relationship with food was something that she experienced firsthand. So it's not just not about like me trying to do all things. It's me acknowledging that there are things that I'm good at and I can share my experience, but it, to solve these problems, it, re- it requires an, an added layer of professionalism and, and expertise and experience that I won't be able to do it alone. I think that's an important point because you could give someone a perfect program, but unless that mental piece is together and unless they understand on the spectrum of what is happening, it's not going to matter. I could say, Natalia, here you go. Here's the perfect diet. But if the- It's perfect for who? <laughs> Well, that's, it's perfect that's, for who? That's a really good point. And, and that's one thing that um, I, I, I talk until my face turns blue and it, it drives me absolutely crazy is that, um, you know, people keep on going to the cookie cutter plan. So I found this diet on Pinterest, on Instagram, and my favorite influencer on social media. I'm like, first of all, your favorite influencer on social media, her job is to have a six pack. Period. And the only thing you guys should be finding on Pinterest are containers for your kitchen. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> I know, and because I was just and looking. Spo- and decor and spoke for and, your yeah, house. And, and also decor. Um, can you talk a little bit about this impression of, I think that in social media, people feel that influencers or individuals walk around uh, stage ready, competition ready, and that may not be the the truth of it or the actual effort it takes to maintain that versus what is possible in real life. Uh, And, and, you know, there is not only that, but there is also the layer of you have Photoshop, you have all the nonsense that people are doing nowadays and really understanding that somebody else's reality is probably very different from yours. Not that you're going to use that as a clutch and be like, oh, because she has it so much easier than me. 
because then it can become just an excuse. Mm. But it's acknowledging and processing that that your um, your experience and the length of time in which is going to take you to create change might be different from that person whose only job is to look good. Thank you to First Form for sponsoring this episode of the show. What I love about First Form is they have a tremendous array of supplementation. And one thing that is very important that I think should be included in everyone's plan is fish oil, especially for women. I know that that sounds surprising, but there's a lot of great evidence to support the use of omega-3 fatty acids for the preservation of skeletal muscle mass and potentially function. If you are someone who is man or woman, not on fish oil, this is your time, this is your year, get yourself together and make sure that you are taking fish oil, not just for muscle health, but also for brain health and mood health. Head on over to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. That's firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. And you will get free shipping when you spend $75 or more. That's firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. So would you say that the real battle is an internal one and it's not really about the nutrition or the diet or the training? That's one thing that I always say. The mind is the set point for the body. If the body changes, but the mind doesn't go with it, your body is going to keep on going back to where the mind is. And, you know, we have enough of that with the data around the weight regain rate on bariatric yeah. surgery. And even whenever we look at the fitness industry per se in the competition world, yeah, people change their bodies, but their mind doesn't really go and the extremes stay there. And then their bodies go back to where the mind is. Yeah. And we see that all the time. Individuals that unless you acknowledge the aspects of the brain and whether it's looking at old trauma, whether it's examining self-talk, whether it is understanding where you are in terms of a worthiness spectrum. Oh my God, yes. That you will continue to only go as high as you feel worthy of going. The good news is the brain can be leveraged. Yes. That part can be addressed. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes counseling. Yeah. But once that falls into play, then perhaps the focus isn't so much on the external. You leverage the external to really become something internally, whether it is disciplined or even strong. Yes. Strong mentally and physically. And and um, I, I, I love that we are very much on the same page about this because, you know, but that change can only happen if the person acknowledges that the change needs to happen up here. Because I just recently was speaking to somebody and whenever I told her about how the pro my program works and things like that, and that, like, oh, I don't need all of that. And this is the same person that has mm -hmm. told me that she's been trying to lose weight. She's probably lost a hundred pounds, the same 10 pounds, uh, 10 times right. for the past five years. Oh, I don't need all that. And I'm like, the fact that you don't realize that there is a much bigger problem with the mindset and the relationship with food and thinking that you have to eat 800 calories shows me that that's what you sweat most. Right. But until the person is willing to acknowledge and address that, no amount of talking from me, you, until our face turn blue, <laughs> is, is going to solve the problem. You're absolutely right. Um, people have to recognize and acknowledge where they are so yeah. that they can move forward. Yeah. Because and take ownership. Yes. Take, let's talk about some of the biggest obstacles that you see. Um, I think, and, 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 and we had this conversation in private at our workouts. And one of the reasons that I personally look up to you very much oh, thank you. is um, because you have had two kids. And, and a man child. <laughs> Hi, Shane. What's up? <laughs> Don't worry. He won't be listening to this. Uh, maybe. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, but I've never heard you actually let me take that back i feel like your career has gone up and up and up in a much faster rate since you had your kids so 
I admire the fact that you don't use your kids as a reason why, oh, I don't have time. Oh, I'm too busy. Oh, because of my kids. Listen, your kids are not putting cake inside your mouth. You're no. eating it yourself. And well, technically, they sometimes try to. <laughs> <laughs> that and boogers and whatever else. Oh, the but, boogers. Yeah. Yes, yes, the boogers. They're great. Um, but you say, like, there, there has to be a layer of personal accountability because people are like, oh, I need accountability. Yes, external accountability is great, but until you take personal responsibilities over your choices, no amount of external accountability is going to make up. And the oh, it's because my husband ordered pizza. Okay. All right. What like what about it? Does it make the journey a little bit more challenging? A hundred percent. But if you keep on using that as the reason why you cannot accomplish your goals or move forward. You're just going to stay where you are unhappy, which then is going to bleed because we also have plenty of research on that, on how dissatisfaction with your physical appearance, it starts to impact your quality of life. You start to, you know, not want to be sexually active with your partner. You you start to not want to go to social events and you start to become more out of an introvert, but not because you are, but just because you don't want to be seen. So... I find that people are oftentimes very short-sighted on the side effects of not feeling good and feeling confident mm. and use everybody else as, oh, I'm busy. Oh, okay. Like, so, so, so are you, so is the person next door. And, and even like I, I was just being nosy the other day and I did a Google on the top C female CEOs in, in the biggest companies in the world. If you look at every single one of them, you do not have any one of them, they're severely obese. Mm. Doesn't that tell you something? Are you going to tell me that because you have two dogs to walk and one kid to fe feed, that your life is so much more busy, so much busier than a CEO of a Fortune 500 company? Right. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So do you find that parents or people, one of the biggest things that they run into is the obstacle of excuse. Yes, because it is much, and, and that's something that I talk often is the moment you start to put that responsibility on some, one is not fair to put that responsibility on your kids, uh, but it's because they become so afraid of committing that they just start to create problems. I don't know necessarily if the word would be excuse, but they just start yeah. to create problems because people are so failure averse that they rather stay in a place of mediocrity than to take things to the next level and take the chance. And, and that's something that I always think for myself. And I'm like, imagine if I was afraid of failure back to when I was 20 and I didn't move, where would I be where would I now? And I think that whenever we're talking about fitness and about, you know, investing in, in yourself and in your health, be that an investment financial in your time, whatever that looks like for each individual, everything is a 50-50 in life. Your 150 is for you to stay the same. And if you're not happy with where you are, that's the 50 that you're going to choose to stay. Mm -hmm. Or you can take the 50% chance of creating change and live a, live a life that is probably going to be much better than the one you have now. Mm. So one of the things is is the personal responsibility, meaning don't put the onus on anyone else. Yeah. Don't say you can't have time because of your children or you can't have time because of your work. You have to make the time and you have to execute. It's about a hundred percent and it's it's about your priorities and oh, but I, I feel guilty. Well, I understand that, but are you being able to show up your best for your work? And what you're saying though is real. For example, like you mentioned, I work a lot and yeah. working a lot. If I miss a morning training session because I'm traveling, and I haven't seen my kids that day, do you think that I'm going to hit that training session or I'm going to go spend another extra hour with the kids? I'm actually going to hit that training session. And bring them. And bring them. And bring them. Yeah. Because, or involve them in it. 100%. You can find a way. The idea that a family member or the idea that something that is positive in your life would impede your capacity to show up as the best version of yourself doesn't it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. And I also think one of the other things is we're very indoctrinated. We're told that having kids is hard, which by the way, it's is it hard? Yes. Are certain aspects hard? Is it challenging? Yes. Are there always ways to get stuff done? 100%. Yes. 
Now, it's interesting listening to hear you talk because you've worked three jobs. You've lived in really uh, non-ideal environments. You have pushed. You are very self-made and very ambitious and very driven. And I, I want to point that out because I think it's a characteristic that we can learn from. Yeah. And it takes fortitude because, again, we're not just talking about fitness. Yeah. We're talking about the mindset of what it takes to get the job done. A hundred percent. What else would you say is a obstacle for people? So the goal of you guys listening to this is hopefully you see yourself in some aspect of what we're talking about, whether you've been a chronic dieter, whether you are a very busy human, whether you are whatever it is that you are. My goal for bringing Natalia on is so that you can see components of yourself within this messaging. What would you say is another challenge? Would it be a training challenge? Would it be a dieting challenge? What are some of the things that you think kind of um, mess people up or that? I feel like it's a, like a, the third component would be a combination of the two that we already spoke mm. about. You have, you know, somebody who is used to doing the extremes and then they're struggling to be consistent and be accountable. The reason that this cycle happens is because they keep on reverting to the things that worked for them when they had a number of disposable hours in their day. Their life has changed. Their, uh, you know, their circumstances have, have changed. And they expect the same strategy that worked for them whenever they could spend five hours in the gym to work now. And then they keep on giving up not understanding that the reason why they are giving up is because they are using a methodology that no longer suits them right now. And I think that that's the biggest problem. And that's something that I ask often to people. They're like, oh, I'm just like, you know, doing the plans that I did. And I'm like, okay, but whenever you did those plans, did you have three kids? Did you have a career that required you to work 10 hours a day? No. And I'm like, how are you expecting that to work? Because if I, like, and I use myself as an example, if I had to go back to the same strategies that I used when I competed at the Olympia, now I would be having a daily mental breakdown. Oh, uh, yeah. Any of us. So I had to adapt. So I think that if the word mm. that we're looking for is adapting and letting go of an idea of that everything needs to be perfect at all times, because it's not, especially when you have people that depend on you, be that your team be that your kids, be that your spouse. You know, how many times have you been called by your kids at school and be like, ah, mm, yeah, they vomited or they, so this happened. Or that yesterday. Happened. No, just kidding. You, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So, and you have to stop whatever it is that you're doing, pivot and go tend to those people that need you. And and I find that, a, that people let that get to them. And instead of adapting okay, so your training session is normally 45 minutes to an hour and you only have 30 minutes today. And they're like, so what's the point? Throw their hands up in the air. Instead of doing the 30 that they can, they do nothing at all. And then it just becomes a snowball. So it's the inability to adapt to when circumstances Are not happen. perfect. Yeah, and, and it's never going to be perfect. Mm. Like airplanes, it's funny because I have, um, I have a, a member who is a pilot and I was asking her, um, I was like, how many times do you have to adjust the plane whenever you're going from, you know, let's say you're flying from New York to uh, California? How many times do you have to adjust the plane? Even though you have that perfect map put in the computer that you're going to go from A to B. And she's like, loads of times. And I'm like, exactly. You have to adapt. Do you think there is a way, because by the way, again, we trained this morning. You look amazing. Do you think there is a way where it can be less consuming and where it's almost as if fitness and nutrition is not even something that you think about? Yep. What does that look like? How does someone get there? Do they structure their nutrition plan? Do they structure their training? How does it become second nature? I that's that's such a great question. I think that the first thing that needs to happen, it's it's not going to happen overnight. And I think that that's something that we need to make it very clear. It's not going to be like, oh, and I'm cured because we're not just addressing uh, uh, the the physiological side of things. It's not just like, let's change your diet, let's change your nutrition, let's change your training, and that's it, call it a day. There is the psychological piece of it as well that we need to talk about because results might not be as fast. In navigating that challenge of comparing to what used to be whenever you were doing extremes, it's a big layer of it. Or 
you know, if there there is a little bit of a plateau and resorting to that. So navigating that part is probably going to be the biggest piece. But starting with a nutrition plan that works for your life. For example, I'm going to use my mom as an example because my mom is like the she has tried every diet, you name it. You name it. She rocked in my house. Did she try the long, tried the protocol? Forever strong yet? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, she I'm just kidding. She doesn't ask me for advice. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm looking at her. She arrived in my house before Ozempic was even a thing here in the US. She came from Brazil with it. And I'm like, the hell is that? Oh, it's gonna make me lose weight. And then she would go to the bakery and come back with like glazed donuts and all. I'm like, what are you doing? I digress. So if you have somebody who is always on a diet, so I, I called my mom and she was doing the keto diet. And she's like, I lost 20 pounds. And I'm like, great. What are you doing? I'm doing this thing called the keto diet. And I'm like, tell me more. <laughs> like I didn't know. <laughs> but just for context, my mom loves bread. In Brazil, we love rice. It's just what we do. So she's telling me that she completely cut out bread and that she's no longer eating rice. I'm like, so if you're eating like five or six French rolls that have 120 calories each every single day and you remove that, you can see how it's not just that keto is a magic pill. Mm -hmm. You're removing calories from your plan. And I was like, do you miss bread? She's like, oh my God, so much. I can't wait to eat it again. How is that going to be something that is going to keep her way off in, in the long run if she already is telling me that she can wait to have that again. So really understanding what is your lifestyle? What is something that you can, that you're not going to dread? Because people struggle to stay consistent with something when they completely dread. So there is going to have to have, uh, to happen a, a level of, uh, um, we're going to have to meet somewhere in the middle. Because you can keep on doing what you're doing, but if you keep on going to the extreme, you're gonna the pendulum is gonna keep on swinging on both ends. So, where, how can we find in the middle, find that happy medium? Even if that is, you know, if we're looking with somebody who has Whataburger or Chick Fil A or whatever it is, five times a week. Okay, can we reduce that to three times a week and take it one day at a time? Because it becomes very overwhelming for somebody to completely remove everything that they enjoy right out of the gate because they're not they're not bought in yet they don't trust you yet do you feel that once they begin to see changes that potentially the shackles of what they felt like they needed or what they felt like they could never give up changes a hundred percent and that's one of the biggest things that we do in the internal training with my coaches we need to give them what they want in the first two months so that we can deliver what we know that they need. For example, food or results or what? Results, results, because that's, and even, um, and, and I hate to say this, but the truth is even whenever we have somebody that comes to us and is like, oh, I don't wanna lose any weight. And if they don't lose one pound in the first 10 days, they're freaking out, oh, this is not working. So really understand the in between the lines. That is, uh, I think the biggest piece of coaching is to understand the words that haven't been said. So you can give people what they want. And then once you, ha you are bought in and they're like, oh my God, you're the best thing ever. And I'm like, okay, you trust me now. Because I think that that's a big misconception that many coaches have, that just because somebody has joined your program or has purchased your services, that they trust you, they don't. They do not. They're only gonna trust you the moment that you give them the results that you promised them that you were or at least the tip, at least a little bit of it. Mm. That is the biggest piece I find from my experience of, of coaching that has been pivotal to, to understand people on that aspect. Is basically you have to be able to get a sense of what they want and then deliver what they need. And oftentimes, do they know what they want? Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the show. It is of critical importance that you know your numbers, that you know your ApoB, which is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, that you know your fasting insulin, that you know, that you know what your iron levels are. 
Inside Tracker makes all of these things very easy. Head on over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion, and you can see what is going on within your body. And if you are someone who has been putting this off, here is your message to stop doing that and get your blood work done. How you feel is not always how you are. And the people that are very diligent about getting their blood work done are always five steps ahead of the people that do not. You can be one of the people that gets the job done. Head on over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion for 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion. I try to become as clear as possible, but the thing is that oftentimes they keep it very surface level. And then it kind of goes back to what you were talking about that is like, oh, I want to lose weight. And then the more you start to peel, oh, I I want you to start to lose weight because I haven't been able to have sex with my husband. Or I want to lose weight. I want to lose weight. I want to lose weight because I want to feel good. Why do you want to feel good? Oh, because I haven't taken photos with my kids in a year and a half. That is just, it's so heavy. You know, it's so heavy mentally, the, the burden of not being able to enjoy life because of the constraints of weight or nutrition or yeah. lifestyle is and, just, it's heavy. And th- th- I'm, I might go on a tangent. And I like that the tangent. Because that's something that pisses me off royally. And it's whenever you have a woman that is like this, okay, that... Um, finds herself in a position where she doesn't want to be intimate with her husband. She, I, I've had ladies that canceled vacations with their family, won't take their kids to the pool. Will, you know, they're, and, and we, we see this everywhere that we go, everywhere that we go out. We were in a, on the beach uh, a couple months ago and I looked around, it was just the dads playing with the kids because the women were like wrapped in a whole bunch of clothes sitting on a chair, some of them wearing leggings and it's like a hundred degrees. I'm like, girl. So, and what happens a lot of times that I see is that they put the power of decision in their husband's hand from a financial standpoint. Oh, my husband. And, you know, from from a, a business perspective, I understand that a lot of times it can just be uh, smoking screen. But more t- there have been several occasions. I, I mean, I've had a call with a lady who cried and her husband basically told her that he wasn't attracted to her. He wasn't a call. And at the end of it, he was like, yeah, we're not. We're not. Yeah, no, we're not investing in a program for you that can help you. Why are you putting yourself in a position where other people are making decisions Mm -hmm. for what is taking your life away. You're just existing at that point. Because if you're not taking photos with your kids, if you don't want to be intimate with your husband, if you don't want to go on vacation, you're, I mean, there have been some ladies that told me that they didn't even want to go to the park with their kids. If you're living, living like that and you're putting the responsibility of making a choice on somebody else's hand that has never lived a day in your life, that's wrong. Yeah, that is. And the good news is it can be addressed. Yes. It can totally be addressed. When you, what are some core nutrition fundamentals that you guys put into place? Um, Like, do you prioritize protein? Oh yeah, we always start with protein. (laughs) But I mean, again, so you guys, I am not setting her up here. I kinda (laughs) am, but I'm not. She does a ton of weight loss with her clients. So I'm just curious as to some of the- Start with protein. And again, I'm not setting her up for this. That is, yeah. So talk us through a little bit about how you guys think about nutrition. Yeah, like the the delivery of of that is going to ultimately depend on where each person is in their journey. But the first thing that we look at, especially when we were working with the more perimenopausal menopausal women, because they do come from a um, background of, you know, Jenny Craig, or like a lot of them are doing yes. the Optivia and Nutrisystem, which is incredibly low in protein. And they are reporting all these issues and pains and aches and that they cannot keep muscle. And they, I'm like, okay, we tell me how much protein you're eating. And then we normally take it from there. 
And, and every plan that we're creating always is created around the protein. It's crazy, right? Yeah. It's crazy that that protein is even controversial at this point. Wait, what? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, come yeah, you'll have to. Well, I mean, you'll have to listen to episode number uh, twenty-seven. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and then twenty-eight and twenty-nine. What? And then how do you think about carbohydrates and fats? Um, again, it, it really comes back to where the person is in their journey. So if we we get somebody, and and that's kind of the the human psychology piece of it in the experience with coaching. If I get somebody that from the get-go is telling me, oh, my body does terrible with carbs and I hate carbs. I, I haven't got their trust yet. Mm. So if I put them to have bread and rice and potatoes and all that kind of stuff from the get-go, and if they've been depleting themselves from carbs for so long, chances are that in the first week or two, what's going to happen? Their weight's going to go up. What's going to happen? I'm going to lose their trust. So and can you talk about that? Because you do see that, right? Because we see that those individuals that have been severely carbohydrate restricted over time or even calorie restricted, when you begin to add in more calories and carbohydrates, your weight goes up a little. Yes. And so that's kind of playing that dance of delivering what they they want so we can gain their trust, mm -hmm. but also not doing something that is going to harm them or make matters worse. So it's that constant dance of finding the happy medium of at least in the initial two or three months. I find that those two and three months in the, in, in, like in the beginning are very crucial because any change, and it's, it's funny because I had somebody that came to me, she's like, I just lost four pounds. And I was like, okay, would you be that disappointed if you had gained four pounds? She's like, no, I'd be freaking out. And I'm like, okay, why is the difference? Another good point. I love that. So it, it's really, um, I find that coaching is a lot about helping people see things from a different perspective. And you do have to give them what they want in the beginning. So to answer your question, if I get somebody who is a carbophobe, I can't put a whole bunch of carbohydrates right out of the gate. It's going to be a lot of protein, moderate carbs, and then fat. Get results. Cool. And then you start to incorporate some things that they thought that it was impossible to eat. Do you see people come from dieting extremes? Like, like I'll give you an example, whether it's keto or all plants or all meats, do you see dieting extremes? A hundred percent. We had a lady that was scared of eating dates. Dates. She yeah. binged on dates. Mm. She didn't eat anything else. There, there are so many extremes that, that we, we see. And um, I find that, and I have a very good friend who is a vegan and I roast her all the time. So, <laughs> but I find that the, the miseducation around veganism and that it is somehow superior for health when we do not have like concrete evidence. No, there's, there is no evidence for that. And in fact, there are nutrients like calcium and things that are at risk for children and other populations. Yeah. So, yeah. And and so, so anyway. do we have some some members who are vegan? Mm -hmm. Yes, we 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 navigate that the best that we can. Uh, but I, I I just find it interesting at the entry point whenever I'm talking to some people that is like, oh, you know, I'm vegan because it's so much better and. Oftentimes, we're talking about the more like late 40s, early 50 demographic. And I'm like, you are the person who should not be vegan right, right now. Right. If like, you're younger, go right ahead. But uh. yeah. So, um, you know, I, I find that navigating those things are the, the dance. What about alcohol? People always ask me alcohol in your programs or have you found that alcohol is a slippery slope to other kinds of foods? How do how do you guys navigate that? So I, I do a lot with women who have a like like life, a social life, a lot of, you know, um, corporate and a lot of corporate events. Is it realistic for me to tell a woman like this who is always hosting clients? Mm -hmm. Is am I gonna be giving her the best tools to be sustainable and to be consistent long term by telling her you can never drink again? What I can do as a coach is to give her the education around it, around it give some boundaries mm -hmm. and let her make the educated choice. 
because that's why I, I am like, this is not the Natalia Mello daycare. I am I'm not <laughs> anybody's babysitter. What I'm going to do, because I think that it is the job of a coach, is to give you the tools. And then with those tools and knowledge, you make the decision that you find most appropriate for you. Because what I find is that a lot of people, am I pro, uh, if, if one of my clients wants to have alcohol and that is going to keep them on plan, because I've given her the opportunity to have that and I start to help her understand that she can have a glass of wine or she can have a bit of chocolate and she has to make that choice. It's a decision that she gets to make. So um, what I found is that a lot of people that were just told alcohol is bad, don't ever drink again. Whenever they did drink, because it's going to happen. They just went off the rails and then got white girl wasted and it felt <laughs> bad because because they thought that they had oh, already fucked up, so I'm just going to keep on messing it up, and then they make bad food choices. But if I tell them, hey, it's fine, it's a glass of wine, you're cool. You can have a glass of wine, and you can have uh, some chocolate. They know that they can, and they're empowered to make the decision on their own. As opposed to being fully restricted and then going off the rails and never coming back and probably getting depressed. It's this whole cycle that happens over time. Correct. And and I find I, I don't even like the whole idea of, I get asked all the time before I, I start speaking with somebody, they're like, oh, am I allowed to do this? I'm like, you're allowed to do whatever you want. It is not my job as your coach to tell you what you can or cannot do. I'm dealing with grown ass adults. I'm going to tell you what is more aligned with your ultimate goal, but I'm not going to tell you what you can or cannot do. I don't think that is the job of a coach. Mm. My job is to educate people and point them in the right direction and allow them to make decisions. And I think that that's why people fail so much over and over again when it comes to their fitness and nutrition, because there is no personal autonomy. There, the autonomy gets removed when a coach is telling the person that they, you can do this, you cannot do this, it's bad, it's good. Why, why does it have to be so dichotomous? Like, mm. That's, that's very well stated. What about um, training? Is that a piece, just exercise? Is there certain places that you guys start? Um, I know that you probably have coaches that help design programs. What, where do they typically start? So the training, again, it's gonna be very personalized for each individual. For, ex oops. for example, um, we have a lady who is a pilot for American Airlines. She's gone all the time. And then we have another lady who, you know, has a full home gym, who is 50 and she has an hour and a half to train every single day, six days a week. Our Girl, you better be looking smoking. Fly, fly as hell. <laughs> so, but but are these two individuals gonna have the exact, can they have the exact same plan? No. So it really is, and this one, let's say is 250 pounds. And this one is starting at 160 pounds. I'm gonna ask you another question. And you guys, I'm not setting her up. Is there a core fundamental action or exercise modality that is not negotiable what do you mean by that like well, i don't want to give it away but cardiovascular training versus resistance training do they oh we're always going to have some uh, like we're, we're primarily going to focus on resistance training people had not set her up for this matthew i'd not set her up for this <laughs> yeah, um no and it's why be why resistance training because if we're if we're especially as okay so we're talking, a lot of my demographic is 35 and above, 35, 60, give and take. These women have kids. Cardio is not going to help those women being functional to pick out their kids from the floor. Didn't set you up for this. Yep, I agree. So like, why? And, and you know, whenever you're looking at overall kind of like energy expenditure, and, and I know I'm preaching to the car, uh, car. how do you say and a language barrier? Choir. <laughs> Choir, that, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> language barrier, man. Um, That's okay, it, you're really good at the swear words, so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, 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 those ones. So um, you, you have somebody who has a child and has to pick their child up from the floor. And from uh, energy expenditure, even if we're like obsessing over fat loss, fat loss is the best thing, let's do cardio. That accounts for what, like five, seven percent of your total daily energy expenditure, how much you're going to spend in the gym. Why are we not utilizing that time to make sure you're becoming physically strong to perform in life and to not 
depend on somebody to wipe your butt when you're 70 or 80 years old. Right. So we focus on strength training because of the functionality of it and two, for the longevity of it. It's, as you age, we want to make sure that these ladies are able. And we had a member who was 72, Norma, loved her, legend. She was still like snowboarding with her it's grandchildren. Incredible. And had been strength training most of her life. So if that is not a testimony to how important muscle strength and muscle development and strength training is for longevity and quality of life, I don't know what is. Man, you said so many amazing things. I have one more question for you. Where do you think the biggest myth is? Oh, geez, how much? <laughs> do you, you really want to live with I me? Mean, <laughs> I, I, I mean, or just the one thing that just really rubs you the wrong way. And by the way, you guys, I will tag and Natalia's uh, Instagram. It's hilarious. I'm sassy. It is, it is hilarious. Um, <laughs> it's, I mean, you guys just have to go see it. It's so funny. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah. What do you, is there anything that just really irritates you aside oh, from so, Karen? So <laughs> aside from Karen. Me. Uh, um, I think that um, the whole idea of like, oh, you worked before, I'm going to go back to it. And it's like some kind of form of cookie cutter plan. I, I really do feel that that is what is setting people up for failure. And the whole idea that people have not been able to define what is, quote unquote, you worked. You worked, why? Because you lost 30 pounds, but then what happened after that? You gained 40. So it didn't essentially work. Correct. But it's just the idea of like, you worked short term, but then they keep on repeating that they want something long term, but they are going to go back to the short term fix. And it's some, you know, cookie cutter, $25 kind of challenge that they're like, oh, my God, it's amazing. And and the from women's standpoint, um, I think that if we can kind of piggyback on that as well, is I find that women take pride in, you know, cannibalizing themselves in it's kind of like the martyr syndrome there, there is a level of pride oh i'm not gonna like i can pay for my kid to do this that and the other meanwhile they're unhappy in not being able to be fully present and set a, an example for their kids but hey let's spend 30k on you know cheer camp mm -hmm. and do all those things when you don't have one photo with your child I much rather feel good to be present with my kids and to be active and to set an example for them because we also have plenty of research that shows that the kids are going to go much more by what they see at home than what you tell them. Oh, you're think positive. You're so amazing. Meanwhile, that woman doesn't even want to look at herself in the mirror. I'm like, what do you think that your child is going to mm -hmm. pick up while you're telling her that she's amazing and that she needs to be confident and a badass mm -hmm. when you don't even love yourself enough to look at yourself in the mirror? So I think it's the, the whole myth that you have to give everything to everybody at the cost of your own being. And then by the time you get to your deathbed, you don't even have a photo with your children. Natalia Mello, this is very, very powerful. I'm so grateful for you being on the show. It is just full of sass and information. And I think that this can frame things for people so that they can see where their strengths are, strength, where their weaknesses are, and what they need to do about it. A hundred percent. And no, thank you so much for having me here. It's been a pleasure. And it's also so cool to have this kind of conversation with somebody who really sees eye to eye to, to the things that I'm talking about. So thank you. And where can people find you? Oh, what's up? On, uh, you already kind of teed it up on my socials. Uh, it's Natalia Melofit. Natal I didn't really think that one through when I kind of created the handle, but here we are 10 <laughs> years later. It's Natalia, N-A-T-H-A-L-I-A, -A -A, Melo, M-E-L-O, Fit, F-I-T, um, on Instagram and my website as well, nataliamellofit.com. Um, and then I also have a, a podcast, which you're going to be coming once the, the book madness kind of chills craziness yes. yeah it's a good it's a good craziness um it's called unfiltered fit life because of course i <laughs> love it well we're gonna link everything and again thank you so much for your time thank you mm -hmm.